Today, we're gonna to be talking about everything gallstones. So if you wanna know what a gallstone is, how gallstones form, and how you might be able to educate your patients to decrease their risk of getting gallstones, this is the video for you. You gotta be an expert in gallstones if you're gonna be a general surgeon, so let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room. And of course, if you're gonna take exams, I want you to crush those too. Today, we're talking about gallstones. So why are we talking about gallstones? Well, in the United States alone, there are 20 million people with gallstones, and this is on the rise. Gallstones is something that we see in the emergency room or in the clinic every day, and especially in pediatrics. I'm seeing 10 times as much gallstone disease in children as I did in my training 10 years ago. So today, we're gonna talk about what a gallstone is. We're gonna talk about the different types. I'm gonna tell you how these gallstones form, and we're gonna talk about how we can decrease the risk in our patients of getting gallstones. So if you're a patient, this could be a really educational video for you. And of course, if you're a trainee, I think you're gonna find a lot of value here. As a reminder, if you like this content, give it a like, give it a share, engage in the comments, and of course, subscribe to the channel. That lets me know that I'm providing value and you like what I'm putting together. So let's get into gallstones. Now as a surgeon, when I think of gallstones, I think of a picture like this. All right, so a gallbladder that's been taken out of a sick patient that is full of hundreds of stones. Clinically, we're gonna see gallstones in that patient who comes to clinic with intermittent crampy abdominal pain radiating to that right side. They may come to the ER with constant abdominal pain because now they have an infection related to their gallstones. It's important to remember the anatomic relationships to the gallbladder. So you have the gallbladder right adjacent to the biliary tree where the gallbladder empties. That is right adjacent to the pancreas. And if we have complications from having gallstones, we can get inflammation of the gallbladder, so acute cholecystitis. We can have obstruction of that biliary tree or cholecystitis, which can lead to jaundice and an obstructed bile duct. We can even have acute gallstone pancreatitis because the pancreas is right there, as you can see right here. So let's define gallstones. So what is a gallstone? This is a common picture right here. So if you were to open up a gallbladder after doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and take a look inside, you might see a bunch of smooth, varying size, lightly pigmented green stones, okay? And these are your gallstones. So why do these develop? Well, gallstones, and I'm gonna tell you all the different types, okay? But gallstones develop when a particular substance gets super saturated and exceeds its ability to be soluble in bile, okay? That's why we get gallstones. Whether it's a cholesterol stone or a bilirubin stone or a calcium bilirubinate stone, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you what they are, okay? It's just because that particular substance, whether it was cholesterol, bilirubin, or calcium bilirubinate, exceeded its ability to be soluble in bile. So let's get into the different types of stones. So the first type of stone is the pure cholesterol stone. And I'm gonna spend some time going through the pathway and why these develop and how you may be able to decrease the risk of these developing in your patient, okay? Second, I'm gonna tell you about pigmented stones, all right, why do those develop? And then third, we're gonna get into mixed pigmented stones. But first, let's start out with cholesterol stones. Why do we get cholesterol stones? To begin to understand any of the types of gallstones, we gotta ask our question, what is bile? Okay, so in this canister right here, you see bile and it's that deep, dark green fluid, okay? If somebody comes in with a bowel obstruction, perhaps they've been vomiting bile, or you have a nasogastric tube in and it's pouring bile out to decompress the GI tract, but we gotta understand bile if we wanna know why gallstones happen, okay? So what are the contents of bile? So in bile, we have bile salts. Okay, we're gonna talk about what a bile salt is. We have 
phospholipids. Okay, most common phospholipid in bile is gonna be phosphatidylcholine. I'm gonna tell you what that is, all right? We have cholesterol. And then we have bilirubin, that gives it that green color. We have water and of course electrolytes, some vitamins and other nutrients, okay? And that is basically the majority of what constitutes bile. Let's get into the bile salts. So what is a bile salt? Some people will also call these bile acids. Why do we need bile acids? Well, bile acids assist with digesting and absorbing fats, okay? Well, how do we get a bile acid, all right? Well, bile acids come from cholesterol. And if we look at the generation of bile acids, all of this happens within the liver, okay? Now, we have primary bile acids and we have secondary bile acids. Now, your primary bile acids are after cholesterol gets in the liver, it gets hydrolyzed. And what that means is adding a bunch of hydroxyl groups or OH groups. And that creates a hydrophilic component to that bile acid, all right, so that it can digest fats because cholesterol itself is hydrophobic. So water fearing or water avoiding, whereas hydrophilic is water loving. So by hydroxylating cholesterol, we form a primary bile acid. No, those primary bile acids are cholic and kenodeoxycholic acid, okay? Then we can get secondary bile acids, which are also created to the liver. And these secondary bile acids, which also assist digestion and absorption of fats, are when the primary bile acid is conjugated or combined with either glycine or taurine. And that's gonna form glycocholic acid or taurocholic acid, and those are our secondary bile acids. Now you can see in that little diagram, cholesterol going to the liver, gets hydrolyzed to form the primary bile acids, those get conjugated to the secondary bile acids, and then the bile caniculi, where those, where that bile is formed, squeeze and push those bile acids into the bile. And then that bile is stored in the gallbladder. One thing I wanna say is that primary bile acids are essential for dissolving and digesting and absorbing fat, okay? Also important, for digestion and absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, so vitamins A, D, E, and K. Now, we can make primary and secondary bile acids to digest fats, but also through what part of the intestine? Through the terminal ileum, we can reabsorb bile acids and have that supply so that we can digest fat, and that's called the enterohepatic circulation. Well, let's get into that next component. So what is a phospholipid? Okay, well I have an example, like a diagram of a phospholipid right here, but basically a phospholipid is a glycerol backbone with two fatty acids, and then the next carbon is connected with a phosphate as well as a small organic molecule. Okay, so the most common phospholipid that we see in bile is phosphatidylcholine, and it's also called lecithin, all right? Now, what is the purpose of a phospholipid. Well, a phospholipid has that hydrophobic tail, but it has that hydrophilic head. So it can help form these micelles, and those micelles will help dissolve fat. Now, we can't just absorb full fat that's ingested, okay? We have to break it down. And phospholipids, specifically phosphatidylcholine, helps break down these fat, form micelles, so that that fat can be absorbed and digested. Okay, it also helps in cell membranes and phospholipids are also anti-inflammatory. So that's important to consider. Now, as I said, the most common phospholipid in bile is phosphatidylcholine. It's also known as lecithin, okay? And lecithin can be taken as a supplement. When taken as a supplement, it can improve the digestion and absorption of fat. It can lower cholesterol levels. It can reduce inflammation. It can protect the liver, especially in alcoholic liver disease, okay? And it can also decrease the risk of gallstones. And I'll put some good literature in the reference section so you can check that out. You may be asking yourself, well, how can I supplement or how can my patient supplement with lecithin? Well, the first is just a healthy, balanced diet and knowing foods that are higher in 
phosphatidylcholine or lecithin. So egg yolks, for example, sunflower seeds, soybeans, even peanut butter is high in phosphatidylcholine and lecithin. So some of those foods in your diet or in your patient's diet can help balance and create that positive ratio so that we can have good fat digestion and absorption. Now, the third component of the big three is cholesterol. Okay, so what is cholesterol? So cholesterol is a waxy, fat-like substance. You can see the structure here if, you, if that's important to you or you can remember it, okay? But this is found in all cells in the cell membrane, okay? It's important for the production of hormones, for the production of vitamin D and other substances. And in the liver, remember, it's important in the formation of bile acids. Now, how does cholesterol get in the bile? Cholesterol gets in the bile from bile acid production, okay? Well, cholesterol also gets in the bile from the bloodstream. So if we have diets that are high in fat and high in cholesterol, our bloodstream is going to have a higher proportion of cholesterol, and that's going to find its way into the bile where it can get supersaturated and form gallstones. So why is all of this important? Why is it important to understand bile salts and phospholipids and cholesterol? The reason is because of this solubility triangle, okay? Now, I'm gonna take you through this. So in the solubility triangle, we can see that we have this white area and we have this blue area, okay? So the blue area is where the bile is in solution, okay? That we don't have any crystals, we don't have any stones, we have a perfect amount and balance of cholesterol, bile salts or bile acids, and phospholipids, phosphatidylcholine, okay? When that triangle gets out of balance, so if we have too much cholesterol or not enough bile acids or not enough phospholipids, substances can crystallize, okay? And commonly, that substance that crystallizes is cholesterol, okay? Now, it doesn't just have to be too much cholesterol, but you can see, looking at the different arrows, that as we get these changes, cholesterol or bilirubin, in the case of pigmented stones, can be hypersaturated and then crystallize and form stones. So what are some of the risk factors in getting cholesterol stones, all right? Well, one is stasis of bile, and that's when the gallbladder is not contracting, okay? Now, we can see that in rapid weight loss, okay? So we see that in bariatric surgery. Uh, patients postoperatively can have an increased risk of getting gallstones. We can also see bile stasis in pregnancy. So women that are pregnant have a little bit higher risk of getting gallstones. We see a higher percentage of gallstones in patients who are obese. Female patients have a higher risk of getting gallstones. And of course, there are some genetic hypercholesterolemias. Okay, and I'll put some references again in the description below. Metabolic syndrome can increase the risk of gallstones. As I said, rapid weight loss, bariatric surgery can increase that risk. Prolonged fasting can increase the risk of gallstones. And then finally, ileal resection. And if we go back to the bile acids, we resect the ileum, we don't have that enterohepatic circulation so we can get a drop in our bile acid pool. That can lead to an imbalance with too much cholesterol and again, supersaturation with crystallization and gallstone formation. So how can we decrease the risk of getting gallstones? Well, number one is to maintain that balance in the gallbladder. And so how do we maintain that balance between cholesterol, bile acids, and phospholipids? Well, we eat a healthy, balanced diet. We drink plenty of water. We get to a healthy weight and we lose that excess weight. We stay away and avoid fatty foods or foods that are high in saturated fats and cholesterol, and we get exercise. I'll put some references in the description below to show you the good peer-reviewed journals with some evidence that these things lead to a decreased risk of gallstone formation by maintaining a balance in that solubility triangle. There have been some supplements, for example, supplementing with lecithin, or there's some drugs that are available, but in reality, if we can maintain a healthy diet, drink plenty of water, lose excess weight, get exercise, avoid these fatty foods, 
That is the preventative measure that we can take to decrease our risk of getting gallstones. So what are the other types of gallstones, okay? Well, we can see this right here. So we have cholesterol stones, we have pigmented stones, and we have mixed pigmented stones. We talked about cholesterol gallstones. Well, the next type are pigmented stones. So pigmented stones are pigmented because they are formed from bilirubin that is super saturated. Well, how do we get super saturated bilirubin? What does bilirubin come from? Well, bilirubin comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin. And so we see pigmented stones. We can either have black stones or we can have brown stones. And that comes from increased RBC or red blood cell turnover, for instance, in a hemolytic anemia or in a red cell disturbance like a liptocytosis or hereditary spherocytosis. And we can also see this in patients that have Gilbert's syndrome. So black stones are made of bilirubin and brown stones are a little bit different. That's when bilirubin combines with calcium to form calcium bilirubinate these are found most commonly in patients with Asian descent. We also see this after infections in the biliary tree. And so pigmented stones happen because we get increased RBC turnover most commonly, all right, from some sort of hemolysis leading to too much bilirubin in the bile that precipitates out and forms these very small stones. They are more commonly symptomatic because they are small and can travel out of the cystic duct causing either acute cholecystitis getting stuck in the cystic duct or traveling down and causing an obstruction with jaundice, with cholecystitis, or of course obstructing the pancreatic duct and leading to acute pancreatitis. And they are more symptomatic because of their small size. Now the last one to talk about are mixed pigmented stones. Now I like to think about mixed pigmented stones as basically cholesterol stones, okay? Because they're cholesterol, but not totally pure, 100% pure, pure cholesterol. They're cholesterol combined with bilirubin. So they're the most common type of stone. So if we see those stones that I showed you in the beginning, or I'll show you right here again, okay, there's a light green pigmented stone that's a mixed pigmented stone. It's a cholesterol stone where cholesterol is combined with bilirubin. And that's what gives it that green color. All right, so today we covered gallstones. I hope I got you confident in understanding what bile is, all the different components of bile, bile salts, phospholipids, cholesterol, then bilirubin water electrolytes, and the importance of that solubility triangle. I hope I also got you confident in understanding what we can do to decrease our risk of getting gallstones, then of course your patient's risk of getting gallstones and gave you some things to think about. Then finally, we talked about the other types, the pigmented and mixed pigmented stones. We're gonna do a whole series on hepatobiliary problems. We're gonna start with symptomatic cholelithiasis. We're gonna talk about acute cholecystitis. We're gonna get into cholodocolithiasis or when the stones get stuck in the biliary tree. Then of course, acute gallstone pancreatitis, all right? So lots to talk about here. It's gonna be a great couple of videos. So as always, if you like this, give it a like, give it a share, engage in the comments, ask me some questions. I'd love to engage with you guys. Check out citizensurgeon.com. I have a heap of information there. And as always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.